It gives me a great pleasure uh, this morning uh, on behalf of the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences to welcome you to this inaugural Mark Marshall Memorial Lecture. My name is uh, Kareem Damji, for those of you that may not know me, the chair of the department. And, um, you know, the genesis of this for me uh, was about the importance of acknowledging contributions of our predecessors, uh, ancestors, if you will, because I think that it's extremely important. Uh, Dean Fedorak is very fond of saying we stand on the shoulders of giants uh, to recognize contributions, but also the value systems of these individuals, what they stood for, how they managed to get things done. And I think it's important that we draw on the very best from that heritage of the past uh, as we carry forward and make new discoveries and contributions uh, ourselves together for the future. And so I'm particularly happy to see the residents and some of the trainees here, in addition to our faculties, uh, not only in ophthalmology, but from vision science and elsewhere. So welcome all of you, uh, friends and supporters as well. And uh, with that, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Fraser Brenneis, uh, who's the acting vice dean of faculty affairs, uh, to share with us some thoughts on behalf of the faculty of medicine and dentistry. Thanks very much, Fraser. Who's going to do that? Thank you, Kerm. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I would like to begin by respectfully acknowledging that we are located on Treaty 6 territory, traditional lands of the First Nations and Métis people. It is a pleasure to be here on behalf of Dean Richard Fedorik, marking the inaugural lecture of the Mark Marshall Memorial Lectureship Series. By recognizing a pioneer of the faculty like Dr. Mark Marshall, we have a great opportunity to look back at the 80-year history of excellence that has brought the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences to where it is today. Originally established as the Department of Ophthalmology and Rhino-Otolaryngology, the department became an example of outstanding patient care, education, and research. Dr. Marshall's leadership as chair of the department and as the director of postgraduate medical education for the faculty were key for the development of our first residency programs. Certainly, ophthalmology was one and an important one, but many other clinical disciplines owe their beginnings as residency programs to Dr. Marshall. He provided the University of Alberta with its own Marshall Plan for the development of our postgraduate training programs. Dr. Marshall's contributions served as the foundation for important milestones in ophthalmology here at the U of A. And I will certainly let Dr. Morgan, our guest speaker, tell you more about Dr. Marshall and how his impact on the careers of many of our students occurred, as well as our postgraduate residents. Again, I want to reiterate the importance of celebrating our past leaders and health professional, professionals whose determination and hard work have helped forge the history of our faculty and its departments. It is also thanks to their work that our ophthalmology residency program provides the majority of ophthalmologists practicing in Western Canada today and prepares world leaders who advance fields like strabismus, glaucoma, cornea, surgery, and other subspecialties. The Mark Marshall Memorial Lecture Series is a key space to bring us closer to the achievements of those that came before us and inspire us to build on their legacy to improve our research, our education initiatives, and the care we provide to our communities. Thank you, and I wish you a great day. Thanks, Thank you. So it gives me great pleasure uh, to say a few words uh, by way of introduction uh, to our esteemed colleague, uh, who I think many of you know well, but uh, there are some that may not know him too well. Um, and you know, I can think of nobody finer to really um, be the inaugural lecturer. Uh, and Dr. Morgan, I'm so pleased. Uh, thank you so much for accepting uh, our invitation. It's an honor for us that you're here today. And the reason that I say that about Dr. Morgan is, um, you know, in terms of why I think he's an amazing choice for this first lecture, is that um, he knew Dr. Marshall personally for a decade, and I'm sure he'll share many stories uh, with us uh, about that time. But also, he's an Edmontonian, and he did his medical school, residency, internship uh, here uh, at the University of Alberta. He's made tremendous contributions to our department uh, himself, and his clinical professor of ophthalmology. and. Um, he has an amazing CV 
I mean, those of you that would like to leaf through the short CV, which is probably about 20 pages, uh, I think would be amazed. And uh, we have an exemplar uh, here as well. Uh, Dr. Morgan actually um, was participating after uh, medical school in industrial medicine for Air Canada and the Canadian National Railways, did bush medicine in Northern Ontario. And by way of fellowship, uh, he trained in pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus in the United States uh, with three amazing individuals, uh, Art Jampolsky, who at the time was at the University of Pacific, uh, Stanford University in San Francisco, Gunter von Norden, who was at Hopkins at the Wilmer Institute in Baltimore, and then Marshall Parks, um, who was in private practice uh, in the Children's Hospital in Washington. Dr. Morgan has held many leadership positions, uh, both here uh, at the university, but also in, the op in various ophthalmological uh, societies uh, and associations. And so by way of example, he was president of the Canadian Ophthalmology Society, a commissioner on the Joint Commission for Allied Health Personnel in Ophthalmology, referred to as JACAPO, and then an accreditation officer for Canadian and American Hospital and Ophthalmological Training Centers. He's also been a leader in public education. I think that's very important as we move ahead in a complex world to be able to educate the public on visual issues. And in terms of education, that's been a passion of his, whether it's teaching residents, medical students, paramedical organizations and groups, and not only here locally, but nationally, internationally as well, including in Japan. He's received numerous awards, uh, a Special Achievement Award for service from the Canadian Ophthalmology Society, a Statesman Award from the Joint Commission for Allied Health uh, Personnel in Ophthalmology. And on a personal basis, uh, Rod uh, is married and uh, has a wife, June, with three children as well, four grandchildren, is board member of the Edmonton Symphony Society and numerous other connections to civil society. And so family, of course, is very important for Rod, uh, but so is outdoor living, travel, and photography. So Rod, thank you once again, and we look forward to your lecture. Thank you. Okay, well, let's take this time. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Damji, and thank you all for coming. This is pretty early for me. You remember I'm retired, and I had to be here a little bit before you arrived. It's still a great pleasure to have the opportunity to do this. It's a great pleasure to honor Dr. Mark Marshall, and I hope as we go through uh, this session this morning that you have learned something that will make you aspire to be like him, to offer service to your community, to your peers, and to support your family in improving the quality of ophthalmology in our university and in our country. I knew Mark Marshall a long time ago, as we look back. And about two and a half years ago, I heard from a lady named uh, Judith Friedman, who had been brought into the picture by our department under Dr. Jamji, and they decided to do a celebration of 80 years. So two years ago, I was able to do that and pleasantly reported the evolution of our department and its activities. And in that particular presentation, I spent some time talking about the progression of stages. Now, because of time limitations and in the hopes that most of you were there for that presentation, I have not today put the early history into my presentation. I have enough to fill the time, and so basically I had to cut most of it out. I'm going to tease you a little with a few pictures, but if you want the full story, Judith Friedman, who is in the audience, and I will happily introduce her in a minute, has put together a book which is now essentially in final review and will be in press shortly. I've had the privilege of reading parts of it. I think it's delightful. I think it's not only written technically very well, but its manner or style will make it interesting reading for all of you. So I encourage you to become aware of and ultimately, if necessary, to buy a copy of this edition. I believe it will be a very valuable history for our Department of uh, Ophthalmology and Visual Science into the future. Now, Judith is a member of the Classics and History Division of our university, and she has provided some of the pictures that I'm going to use today as well as the University Hospital and University of Alberta. So I'd like to thank her for that, and I would hope that you will recognize this lady for me if she'd stand up. Though there I can see her in near the center at the back. But I do want to recommend that when this book comes out, you read it. It is very interesting. 
to the parts that I've read uh, up to this time. I also want to report, and you can see down here at the bottom, there's a pending article for the Canadian Journal of Ophthalmology, which is, I believe, to be published in February. But whenever it is, I think we have advanced copies, and when we have coffee afterwards, if you like, I believe you can pick one up. So please do that, and you can learn, as it says here, about uh, eight decades of people driving contributions. They're wonderful things. Now, before we get started and talk about the history, I'm going to try to explain something. And this is part of the mystery of this man. When I met him, he was Marshall, but I knew that previously he was Levy. And we tried many times to find out why Levy to Marshall, and truthfully, we never knew. But as I show you some pictures and make comments today, he was known as Levy until sometime after the end of World War II and made the switch to Marshall, and that's what he chose to be. He used to laugh about his spelling of his name occasionally. This is the 1945 yearbook when um, he was involved with the Med Show, and here's one of his associates, Bill Armstrong, who also was, and remember at this time, eye, ear, nose, and throat specialists working in the university system. So in 1945, he became Marshall, and we eventually just gave up asking him why. I have suggestive uh, explanations, but I don't think it's worthwhile pursuing those at this time. Now, for those of you who have been in Edmonton and at the university for quite a few years, this picture will look familiar, but of course, highly changed. This is the period that I'm going to report to you because I was a medical student over in this building, just over here out of the picture, and that is now the uh, dental pharmacy building. And what you see here was the university hospital as it existed at that time. Now to help you understand some of the things, and I will tease you a bit where I can with information that relates to Mark Marshall, over here, and it's gone, this is now the parking lot right across from the Butter Dome. This was the first arena, and it was Mark Marshall when he was the editor of the Gateway, along with other things in the university back in 1920 to 1924, who pushed to get a roof put on that building. It disappeared the year after this photo was taken. This building was more like a big basketball court, so it really is like the Butter Dome, but that used to be used most of the time for examinations. The sports programs were all over the place, and they played there as well, but that was actually the major uh, hall when they had examinations. They had just put up the uh, Jubilee. This was the intern's residence, and to give you a little teaser, I could look across at station 57, which was the I ward in that location, shared with the ear, nose, and throat people, and every month they would issue me a $25 check, and then every month underneath it, it said canceled, and I'd read why, because they provided uniforms and fed me when I was in the hospital. So we were enslaved by the university system, being paid to contract, but taking no money home. And that's what internship and residency was like in those days. This building is the uh, Mewburn. In front of it, and this would be east, is a building that became the major section. Most of the departments had their offices in the lower floors, and then they had the operating room where I'm pointing the laser beam, and above that they had observation halls because heart surgery was just getting going, and you could look down and watch them do heart surgery. But most important of all, the people we have to pay attention to, behind where you see the smokestack was another building, that was the Wells Pavilion. And we'll talk very briefly about Wells. He was one of our uh, ophthalmology founders. This used to be the provincial lab, mostly pathology, and this was the nurses' residence. In those days, the nurses lived in-house when they worked in the hospital. There's a little building that's hidden here, and most people didn't know about it. You can hardly see it. It's this little one right here, and that was Mark Marshall's office. He would be where they now have the uh, research buildings, right across from the education uh, faculty building. And of course, most of these buildings have been totally torn out, and we have the new Walter McKenzie and other buildings that are over here. But you should remember that Station 57, which was on the end, faced a long hall that was approximately a block and a quarter to a block and a half long. And our nursing station was right there at that point, and I will be addressing that issue shortly. Now, in this medical class photo, and this is to demonstrate in part the interest that this little guy, Mark uh, Levy, at this stage, Mark Marshall, had. He was the president of the university medical class, and after he graduated from the University of Alberta, 
arriving in 1920 and leaving in 1924. He went off to McGill and beyond. He became a member of the Canadian, uh, British. He had all kinds of things that he was doing. And at this time, he was joined by 33 other people who graduated. There were three ladies in here, just to make a point, and that was approximately the uh, usual attendance average over the first 15 or 20 years. There was a surprise in this picture that I don't think uh, even Judith knows about. This fellow over here named Dr. Matas was the grandfather of a student who followed me by two years into ophthalmology, but he chose to go to California. So we have in the first graduating class, uh, Dr. Matas, who was a generalist, his son was an internist specializing in TB in the Charles Camsell, and his son again became an ophthalmologist living in California. So it's a small world, and when you look at these pictures, you begin to see how the associations go on. This is the medical staff standing out in front of the uh, east door in the old hospital, the one that was built in 1920-21, having torn down the Strathcona Wooden Hospital and building the first university hospital. I have highlighted in red dots those who were involved in ophthalmology. And here we have Bruce Wells. Here we have Claude Jameson. And up there at the back, Mark Marshall, at that time Levy. Those are the three that have represented ophthalmology in this university from the time the medical faculty began teaching in 1920. And he, by the way, had been here since about 1904. Jameson took over. And then he became ill and in 1940 handed it over to Mark Marshall at the back. And more important, because the Marshall Plan is something that is being fettered here today, if you look at these bars, here are the three creators. Ower, this gentleman here, was the head of pathology. This gentleman is John Scott, head of internal medicine, later dean of medicine. And by the way, Ower also became the dean, I believe for a period of four or five years and then Mark at the back. An interesting group of people, and that is 1931. Now, I have to go to the other end of the scale because we're not talking so much about the beginning here. I'm going to talk about personal memories, but it's to make you realize how, even at the last, Mark Marshall was respected and honored by so many organizations. Here is Sean Murphy, who had just retired as the uh, chief of ophthalmology in the University of McGill program handing out this special award to Mark at the Canadian Ophthalmological Society meeting in 1987. I believe that was his last official award being received. And I could name all these other people back here who have done very, very great things, but we don't have time for that today. So let's summarize the highlights of Mark Marshall's Canadian uh, opportunities. In the Canadian Ophthalmological Society, he was the president. He put together an international congress the same year for educational purposes. When the Hall Royal Commission was working out the process that became our federal Medicare, they had special divisions in all aspects of health. And Mark was the guy who was chairman of the COS committee to look after the ophthalmology services. And his final awards in the COS were 1979 advancements in ophthalmology and, as we see here, 1987, a special centenary award for outstanding eye care. This man never stopped. You'll learn that more and more as I talk further on today. Now, I can't see all of you, and I'd love to look at the students here, but how would you like to get through your training program and get into practice and all that, and then have the Royal College grant you a fellowship without any examination? That's something that's very unique, and that's what they did. He was received into the fold because, in fact, he was one of the organizers of the fold. And he was recognized and accepted that way. He got a fellowship uh, without examination. And he remained the chair of ophthalmology for the Royal College for many years throughout the 1950s. I think it was 57 or 58 when he finished. We can't learn that uh, easily. Now, jumping from that into my personal recollections of Mark Marshall, I'm going to talk primarily in these three areas, education, university, and hospital administration, and my personal opinion about his qualities and his skills, the interpersonal relationship issues. And that's because in 1958, when I was a medical student, I had involvement with the uh, university because I represented the medical students as their president. 
And then when I was an intern, I represented the uh, interns in the university on the Canadian Resident and Intern Association. So I had a chance to get into the administration and met people like Walter McKenzie and other major leaders and at coffee and other times because I was interested in ophthalmology, this subject would come up. So there's a little bit of information that comes beyond just being a student. Now, it's very difficult to stop and think for a minute and say, well, here's what Mark Marshall was like. You start looking for descriptors, adjectives, nouns that will say these qualities. Well, here are the ones that came to my mind first, but I could go on. Personal traits, he was an expert. Mentorship, his fellowship, collegiality, leadership, and civility. And he was so subtle about these things that as a quiet, unassuming little fellow, he just sort of oozed all these things through his manner. The way he talked to residents, he talked to patients, nurses and other people, the way he dealt with issues, and the way he led you on to learn, to be curious, all the things that were required to be a good student. And so in his instructional directives, his personality came out in the quality of his education, in his pushing the individual in personal growth, in pushing for decision-making and responsibility, and the ability to communicate. He drove residents crazy with his demands on communication. So let's talk about education first. When I first met Mark Marshall in a formal way as a student, I was sitting in what we called a level C class, because in those days ophthalmology was of interest but was not examined. You just went and for a period of half a year, twice a week, you got a one hour lesson. And Mark Marshall was the man who gave that. And so he brought, and this was very unique at the time, visual aids, snacks, and uh, generally got involved with the students in the minutes before the class began to personalize and make everyone happy. And by the way, there were about 54, 55 of us in attendance. He would put up his visual aids. He would offer people snacks to keep them awake and involved. He was very clever because he never spoke loudly. He was softly spoken and he was direct and clean. And he used to teach the full program of optics, basic issues of health and disease, talked about pink eye, all the obvious things you'd want a general practitioner to know. Now, he had subtle things that he taught at the same time. And in this second little memory that I'm going to describe here was him bringing in a fellow who was actually in the Mubert at the time. And when he was sitting on the stretcher, he was there to allow the students who had been taught in a three or four week period before how to use an ophthalmoscope. They were instructed to bring theirs, but Marshall had enough to make sure that everybody did and could do them properly. So they got to look into this man's right eye or left eye, and it was a roughly 50-50 split in the students. He had previously in that day taught about arterial and atherosclerosis and hypertension and there were a series of written codes and names to describe all the various features. And now he was giving the students a chance to test this out. So he described this man as being aged, et cetera, and he had these hardening of the artery and hypertensive features in a general statement only and said, please look. Now the students did the looking. And then when they sat down, he would say, would anyone like to tell me who had looked in the right eye, what features you saw? And two or three were bold and forward and they would say, hypertensive, hardening of the artery, whatever features they thought they had seen, and he would thank them for that. Then he would ask somebody to talk about the left eye. Well, in the beginning, it was always who volunteered, and somebody volunteered and said, well, I saw, and he would describe hardening of the artery, hypertensive, and whatever features, and he would be thanked and sit down. And after two or three of these, the fourth person would say, well, you know, I had trouble with the ophthalmoscope. I couldn't see anything. And then Mark would say to this man, well, is there any reason that you can tell the students why they shouldn't be able to see the detail in your left eye? And the fellow would say, yes. And he said, well, before we do, let's talk about that. So he would then teach leukocoria and cataracts and all the other things that made it hard to see. Well, finally he said, well, let's show them what the problem really is. And the guy did the obvious thing and flicked out his artificial eye. Now, my point in telling you that story, because he never went back to the people who fabricated and projected the idea that they had seen when others hadn't. He wanted people to be honest. When you can't see and don't see, in other words, when you don't know what you're doing, you should say that, and you pass that individual on to others. He did that with residents too. In the beginning of his program, he would be with you for examinations. 
He would talk to you about cases. He would make sure that you saw what was appropriate. And if you didn't, he wanted to make sure that you told him. That was very important. And that became general. Now, experiences that relate to him through my hospital practice, and we're talking here as a medical student. I used to sit in meetings and I would listen to Walter McKenzie and the other leaders of the different divisions talking about him, and it was clear that he was a thorn in the side of the university. You know already that he was trying to develop an independent department of ophthalmology and it was never achievable. They went from EENT, and that went separate from general surgery de uh, controlling, or if you like the department of surgery, which included all the other subspecialties. And then they would break off ear and nose and throat from eye, and then they'd go back. It was a mishmash for many years. He actually ran the division but he really never had the kind of responsibility where he was able to say that we had a department. Ellen Gilbert, and I worked in the Mewburn when I was in my first year of uh, residency because of my experience outside running the medical section of the Mewburn for Dr. Gilbert. He uh, knew Mark very well. They were working the same kind of thing. Gilbert was, was British, uh, very talented uh, internist. And by the way, another one who did this as well and helped me tremendously in bridging medicine into ophthalmology was Buzz Edwards. He is also gone, but his daughter isn't. And I'm not sure if Marianne is here, but one of our ophthalmology peers is his daughter, one of our glaucoma specialists. So Buzz was an outstanding individual. But Walter was outspoken, very pleasantly so, and forward. And it was eventually he and Bob Macbeth who finally decided that if Mark would do certain things, they would get a department, but he never would. So it was at that point that Bob Macbeth, who was now the chair of the surgery department, Walter having gone up to uh, be the dean, said that Mark is a guy who would drive you crazy if you don't do what has to be done. And I think that's the way he put it, not what Mark wants. In other words, Mark would send requisitions for a box of pencils, or 500 sheets of paper. He tried to drive the administration crazy, I think, because he really wanted to have an independent department. Now, I've said some of this already, but he wanted to make sure that when you were seeing patients that you did it properly. And so he had meetings and sessions that were sit down and then later with patients and other groups to make sure that you were familiar with the ophthalmological services available. He recommended texts and educational details to get you going. There was no formal plan in those days. Everything was sort of ad hoc, but he made sure that that was not the case. He did that for you. And he was always available if you had a problem. Day or night, you could talk to him and get answers. He was very free, very careful in what he said, but he was very free in helping you if you came to him seeking advice. Now, when I came to dealing with his patients, he, and remember, he was about five foot six at this stage, and he already had scoliosis starting, so he was relatively f forwardly uh, sort of approaching the patient with that lion-like hungry look. They didn't ask many questions. Uh, he really had a lot of power over people that way. But he made them come out where there was an issue. He asked them to be clear and to describe things. So we learned patience. We learned how he got people who were afraid of doctors, because there was a time when doctors were very powerful in the eyes of patients. And in doing rounds, he would teach the residents and the nursing staff everything that related to that patient so that you could ask the junior nurse and she could tell you, you could ask anybody. They were all educated as to Mark Marshall's patients. We had to come in and he was there because we used to do surgery in teams, Monday, Wednesday, Monday Thursday, Tuesday, Friday and rotating on a split basis depending on availability on Wednesdays. And patients were in hospital usually three to four days after their surgery. So you went in seven days a week. And if you had Mark Marshall's patients, and he was in there too. The residents used to have to put in seven days a week. When we did daily dressings, he was fanatical about this. And he's known, even in books that I've, re I've read already, that he was obsessive compulsive beyond what some people feel was appropriate. But he taught perfection. And you knew exactly how long the pieces of tape were. You knew exactly where to put the drapes. He was a remarkable man for fastidiousness. So whenever the cases were being discussed, he would show you all these things. Now in surgery involvement, 
And remember, uh, local anesthesia was very different in those days. We used to do sensory and motor blocks. These were all done by the resident for educational purposes. You would then be involved in the surgery. And if you had the skill, you showed the skill, you very quickly came from first assistant to surgeon, lead surgeon. And every case that you did was recorded. And you could, even at this time, by the time you finished your residency, accumulate over a 1,000 cases where you had been the dominant surgeon for a routine cataract. Hundreds of strabismus cases, that kind of thing. He was very generous once you demonstrated that you knew how to do it. He taught uh, surgical skills where he could on eyes that were coming out. And we were at the beginning of modern surgery in those days. I used to see people with tuberculous sinus granulomas that got into the orbit, tightened up muscles so that you couldn't see the front of the eye. It was spun around. And whenever he had eyes that were dead and we were going to do something with them because of pain and other reasons for nucleation, he would ask the patient, get approval, and we would do other types of surgery that you weren't doing anymore because he felt you should know these on a principled basis. So for those residents who are here, here's one that he knew, Grafie himself, he was one of his students. Von Grafie initiated this technique of doing cataract surgery. And this is to show you how primitive we were, but at the same time, how elegant the surgery was if you knew how to do it. By putting the Grafie knife in, which was about an inch and a quarter long, in the right spot and using the right fashion of penetration, and then manipulating it correctly as you went up to the superior pole, you would not only open half of the uh, corneal uh, surface of the eye, but you had like a cork self-sealing feature. And you could flip this up, you used a variety of things to get the lens out and flip it back. And when I went into ophthalmology, some doctors were still using one suture, one chromic, and that's because they didn't trust the patient. He would take off his patch or rub and things like that. And in those days, iris prolapse was about five or 6%, and that was considered to be very good. Wow, not acceptable. But he made sure that you got a chance to learn, broaden the base of your surgery. Now, records, as I said, were a big issue. And I should tell you this because he was obsessive compulsive for a reason. We're all verbal, we ramble on. That was not okay with Mark Marshall. So when you did your operating reports, your admission histories, your uh, discharge reports, and the residents did them all at that stage, he would examine them. And it took him about five or six months for some, a month or two for others, to get them down to a history would be half of a page. An operating report would be four to seven lines. It was amazing. And what he wanted was just the facts, ma'am. And that's what he got. And when he had you at that level, he was still inspecting your material. And he would comment from time to time when he felt it was appropriate, always in a very nice way. With the Royal College, uh, he I'm sure was involved with all the other leaders across Canada in the organization of the structure. But I want to draw something to your attention that was different. Uh, when I went through, and we're talking about uh, the mid-60s to late 60s, so that was 15 years plus that they had had the Royal College in operation with its process to graduate students. Most of the universities had three-year programs. Not this one, it was four. And to my knowledge, the only person who went through with a, th with a three-year program would have been Wint Duggan, who uh, ended up going to Texas. He was, I think, the first, if not the first, resident who went through this program. And when he came back, they established this residency program in Edmonton that, as long as I remember, I could never find anybody who said that they had taken three years, but others would take three years in uh, the Eastern universities. And that's because Mark always wanted all of his residents to be eligible for the fellowship exam. Three years would get you practical exams, and almost everybody would pass and go out and practice ophthalmology. The extra year was deemed by the Royal College as a year of academia, and if you then took the fellowship exams, the failure rate was horrible. It was, it was, when I look back, it was really awful, because most students did not pass the first time. And I'm talking about Canada now. Not so at this university. Mark Marshall, largely by his own efforts, the pass rate for the University of Alberta was in the high 80s and 90s, and we became well known for that. I was a graduate of the four-year program, and along with two other people, we took our fellowship, the only exam we ever took, and we passed it. So I've only had to face the uh, written 
and the oral examiners on one occasion. And again, I've inserted this just for the residents' sake because it shows you how times change. This is a real examination for the college <clears throat> in pathology and bacteriology, and I got this one of 1962. You had to answer four out of the five questions, the first two were mandatory, and then you chose two out of the bottom three there. And you had three hours to complete it, and you could write as much as you like. But obviously you could see by the manner of this particular style, they not only were after knowledge, but they were after organization and other features that would, in their mind, judge you as reasonable to go out and practice. Another feature that Mark expressed to people, and he, he did this to me, was he wanted everybody to go off and get a subspecialty somewhere. And in general, that happened. Uh, doctor after doctor would finish this program, and most of us went off to the United States. So he encouraged people. Now, when you expressed an interest in a particular field, he had contacts. And I never knew how wide they were until I got to know him later, but when I was in Europe, people would say they knew him personally. When I was in the United States, it just went on and on. So he had contacts. He could open doors for you. And by meeting these people or writing letters where appropriate, he actually did some of the legwork for the residents who got their post-fellowship positions through his efforts, obviously as well as their own. So he was a fantastic person for making it hard for you not to continue your education. And in the process of doing that, of course, he wanted you to come back to Alberta, which at that time most did. And as this was the only ophthalmology program, they came here as compared to going to Calgary, for example. Now, this is one that a lot of people didn't know about and perhaps don't know about today because it comes up every so often. Mark was so generous that even in the end, he would quietly talk to you and say, can you afford to go to, as I did, to California, to Baltimore, to Washington? And we'd have this conversation, and if you had any difficulty, he would give you interest-free loans to carry you. And ultimately, he developed a fund that had a scholarship, and he would give scholarships. And I know one or two of you in this audience have received money from that scholarship fund to help uh, us get on with our education without carrying the burden of cost. He set these up, and I remember the one thing that was unique about his loans, and fortunately I never required them, was you have to buy insurance so that if you don't survive to make the payments, I get my money back. <laughs> that was a cute little thing. And finally, talking about the things that he did, uh, I can remember people who in other specialties, as well as ophthalmology, said, well, we were in Toronto, Ottawa, wherever, and Mark was there and we stopped and we had dinner together and he, he supported and sponsored and shared. He was a fellowship kind of guy, even though you wouldn't believe that when you sort of watched him marching around the hospital. He was quite amazing that way. So let's just think about what happened to that guy and what he started and where we are today. Uh, I was able to review a list of graduate records and I think this will impress you as much as it did me. Between 1949 and current, this university has graduated 120 residents from this program. That's a lot of people. And they represent a lot of good service in many provinces, many states in the United States. And I know of two who went to Europe briefly working in France for a while. So we do even have an international contact. Some are academic, most are clinical, and one or two have gone into ophthalmological research. It's quite amazing. I'm going to tell you a story before we get into the administration about uh, Mark Marshall and the last time I saw him, and I think it was the last time he came into the university system. I, in the picture, showed you where Station 57 was located. And I could see down this long hall because at Christmas time, surgeons in those days shut down their practices. The hospital tried to shut down all of its services. They, they just tried to get away. And the only patients that you had in the hospital were people who had emergencies and uh, had other urgent matters. There were no cases in Station 57, but I was sitting there doing uh, an update on a patient that I was managing for another doctor and this little black shape appeared down at the end of this hall. 
about uh, 125 yards away, I could see this little figure walking from spotlight to spotlight as he walked from the bright to the dark areas. And he came up to the desk at the station, and of course it was Mark Marshall. At this stage, his scoliosis was even more advanced than when I met him as a student. He had bent over very significantly. He could hardly see over the, uh, the, the ramp on the desk. And he said, Rod, I've enjoyed working with you and pleasantries like that. He said, but I have to take a long holiday. So I'm going to take a holiday and uh, we'll see you again one day. Turned around and like in the movies, in the final shots, as the sun is setting, well, here's Mark Marshall walking out to locate an elevator or whatever and leave the building forever. So that's a lasting memory for me to meet Mark uh, in a social way, in a very personal way at the last. It was a very nice meeting and in essence a nice farewell. So now let's jump to the hospital. Let's, let's get into the administration. And there's a lot I could say, but the best thing to tell you here is that the university was flowing in a different direction. Marshall represented the old time. The university was going in the new way. Walter McKenzie had established a research lab. Kowalewski was running it. They were pouring out papers on surgery, etc., for peptic ulcers. The uh, cardiovascular program was starting. Callahan had just done six mitral valve releases and was a hero in heart surgery. All kinds of things were exploding. But the point behind all of these was that Walter McKenzie wanted to have an academic and a research program in each department. And while it was never said to me publicly that was the reason there were problems, I genuinely believe that's one of the main reasons why Marshall could never achieve separate status. It took Dr. Alistair Boyd, who was brought over by the uh, University from Scotland, from Edinburgh actually, and Alistair worked in a tiny little room close to that north end where they were building the operating rooms, uh, an office that you wouldn't want to work in. It was like two cubby holes. And he worked away in there for two years, but he became the department chair when finally in 1964, he took over from Wynne Duggan, who was going to California and became the chairman. That was the beginning of the new program and it truly was the beginning of the Department of Ophthalmology as it has grown from and to be today. Now this is a cute story too because it's typical Mark Marshall. The university, even when I started in the residency program, was trying to find out how old Mark Marshall was because they had a policy. Everybody in the university retired at age 65, period. Willicks, McKenzie, all these people were forced out at 65. So they asked Mark to provide details and without him telling me personally, I was told indirectly that they could never get him to provide any material that would identify his birth date and therefore they couldn't age him. They fought for two or three years and eventually in 1963, I don't know how they reached this judgment, they decided that he was going to be age 60. And that meant that by uh, 1968 he had to prove that he was under that otherwise he would be retired forcibly at age 65. Well, when he left in 1968, he was actually 75. We found that out subsequently. And he was, I will tell you, an excellent surgeon, excellent physician, and uh, a wonderful man right to the last. They lost nothing by keeping him in those extra 10 years. Now, my personal thoughts, and I've already indicated several of them, so I'll go over this quickly. He demonstrated an open, but at the same time, very personal interest in skills and development of each resident. He knew how to read people and he could react to the personal qualities of the individual. He was very skillful in graduating the responsibility and the level of involvement and interchange. So he drew the individual up through management, judgments, decision-making generally. His major contribution to these graduates paid off because uh, with very few exceptions, they passed the Royal College exams, most of them accepting certification at that time, but those who went for fellowship passed as well. He socially and financially helped the graduates, I've said that, and that was very unique at the time. There were no scholarships, you had no money. Remember I got paid $25 a month, which they took back. That's how you got through your uh, internship and your residency in those days. And to finish things off with a little color, he and his wife Marjorie used to invite the residents over, along with other friends, and you would have a social evening. She was a beautiful pianist. They loved art, they collected art, so you could enjoy their art as well as the social hospitality. 
and had some lovely evenings getting to know other residents and other people in the university and in government. Now, if you want to see some things that relate to Marjorie Marshall's uh, history in this university, you should go to the dean's office and look at pictures of the deans in the past. I believe three of those pictures were done by Marjorie Marshall. <clears throat> she also was an excellent painter. So with the things I've told you and giving you the opportunity to read more about Judith's work, I will now tell you that Dr. Watson, who was chair of the Ottawa program, and at that time was a member of the Order of Canada, was quoted as saying Dr. Marshall was small in stature, but a giant in Canadian ophthalmology. Just a few words, simply stated, but profound and totally agreeable. If you wish, you can now go into the hall in the Walter McKenzie Center and read this plaque, which is just outside the Dean's office. I'll allow you to read that because it says how three people, Owen, Scott, and Marshall got together and as a result of the product of the war and the need for specialty uh, training and the desire to become a specialty center in Canada within the University of Alberta, these three people conspired under the name the Marshall Plan to create the uh, postgraduate program of specialty training. Please read that. It is uh, a wonderful thing to know. He's honored with that plaque. So briefly stated, I would like to acknowledge information that I've received to put this together from Judith Friedman, who has done a wonderful job in producing this book, from the university and the University Hospital for photographs. I have many others, but you'll have to see them in her book because uh, we don't have time to show them. And also for the associates who over the years, with Marshall present, but mostly without, have sat at dinner or after dinner and shared stories. We've had some wonderful times, and I don't mean just in ophthalmology, I mean, in all the programs, I was uh, close with people like Malt, uh, Mac Alton, Plastics, Lakey, Urology, I could go on and on. And we all knew and worked with Marshall in one manner or another. And of course, I would also like to thank Dr. Damji and our department for the opportunity to present this presentation to you. It's been an honor, certainly a privilege and a great pleasure to do so. If we have a few minutes, and we do, just a few minutes, I'd be happy to answer questions. So with that, I thank you. Rod, I have the mic here for you. Thank you. Dr. McDonald is asking about Mark Marshall's family. And it's interesting that he, except for the social meetings that we had together, he kept them very separate. I know he had one son who went to McGill, and he graduated, and I believe he went into pathology. And after a period of time working in the system, he gave that up and then went out into practice. Beyond that, I have no knowledge. It's his son who is responsible for establishing funds for the continuous scholarships and other issues within our department. And I, I don't exactly know how much money, but they, they started a Marshall Fund, which is now held by the department or university on behalf of the Marshall family. Mark uh, never talked a lot. He, he, you couldn't get a bad story out of him, really. His, he was either telling you something that you needed to know, or he was silent. He covered everything. I've, in, I've indicated that, I hope, so that if you needed a, a lecture, you got it in a very nice way. And it was always very quick. But the main thing to remember is that he was so well organized, it was unbelievable. And if you'll allow me, just within two or three minutes, I'll tell you that between the time he came to the university in 1920 and the time I got to know him, the mystery about his past was talked about by everybody. In World War I, he wrote the operating manual for the Bren gun. He became um, a, a brigadier, I believe. He worked for the, uh, 
the, the rifle or machine gun division. After the war, he stayed on in Toronto and he was in their administration for a while. Then he came to the University of Alberta and by the time he left it, he had a drama club, had organized four or five language clubs. He spoke four or five languages. He became the editor of The Gateway. I could go on and on. This, this man was a firebrand. And you see him, you could read the clips in The Gateway and other newspapers, quite remarkable. But he was still a man of few words. Yes. The question is, how many residents were in the program at the time? And the answer in the beginning was one resident at a time, at, at my beginning. And they were then going into two residents, which is uh, what I ran into, Ken Schott was my associate. And after that, there were two residents, and then we picked up one or two when Alistair Boyd was chairman, who had gone to other programs and wanted their fourth year. And so they came and this was a surprise to me, but I never asked Alistair to explain why or how that was allowed, but it was done. And so one particular individual came from uh, another program and put in one year. Now, he didn't add much to the department because he was just studying for his fellowship. Not, nobody paid much attention to him. He did probably as little as he had to to just put in his year. He Marshall had by this time gone. But when Marshall was there, it was one and two occasionally. One for most of the years. Mm -hmm. he, he was known by everybody. There wasn't a patient in the city. There wasn't an optician in the city. If you wanted to go to Grand Prairie or Wainwright or Wetaskiwin, everybody knew Mark Marshall. He used to uh, put ads in the newspaper and would take a week or two and disappear to Grand Prairie where he would have a room in a hotel or in a Masonic hall, anywhere he could get, and he would offer examinations for people, provide them the prescriptions, the optician would fill the glasses, and he would bring down those people who needed surgery. He, was a, he did that every year, routinely. That was his outreach service. So, oh, was there a question back there? Okay. Well, I thank you again. It's been a pleasure to offer you these insights. Rod, uh, on behalf of all of us, uh, thank you so much. I certainly learned a lot, and uh, I'm glad the uh, lecture has been recorded. Uh, we hope to share it with posterity, with your permission as well, and uh, I know you've given us that, so thank you, and uh, on behalf of all of us. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Small oh, gift that I'll give you in a minute here. Maybe okay. we can get it. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go over here, and I just have a couple more words, and then uh, I think we'll be done for. Okay, thanks very much. So I'd like to um, thank a few people. Uh, Carmen uh, Wachniak and uh, Shannon Charney, I think, are in the back there. Maybe, Carmen, uh, can you just stand for a moment? Uh, but uh, let's give a round of applause because this event would not have been possible without her and Shannon and Emily Hoffman at the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry who helped with uh, so much of the organization, the poster, etc. And I appreciate the support from the faculty. Judith has already been acknowledged, but uh, not only did she provide some material to uh, Dr. Morgan, but uh, has done a wonderful job uh, with the history. And so another shameless plug for the book that is coming out. And uh, I hope to provide that uh, as a gift on behalf of the department uh, to uh, many of you here. And then the article which is available uh, in press uh, as you have the reception there, so I'd encourage you to leaf through that and uh, it picks up the highlights uh, from the book. But thank you all very much. Uh, it's a privilege uh, to be able to have an event like this uh, and to learn so much uh, from an esteemed colleague. And I hope that those of you that uh, are in the audience, uh, learners and the staff and support staff, the entire team, uh, can uh, you know take this forward and uh, the memories and the values and the contributions uh, as we ourselves uh, forge our way uh, to the future and and uh, rise on a positive trajectory so thank you all very much for taking time to come and enjoy the day and the reception outside <laughs> <laughs>